A very good afternoon to all of you. World Diabetes Day fell on the 14th of November, 2021. And for that reason, for this whole month, actually, there have been a variety of activities to highlight the importance of diabetes and its effect on human disease. So today to discuss diabetes and your heart, how to break the link. I have with me Dr. S.P. Chan, who is a consultant endocrinologist working in Subang Jaya Medical Center. This whole program is brought to you by Subang Jaya Medical Center in conjunction and supported by Roche. So over to you, Dr. Chan. Very good afternoon. So, yeah. yeah, so, okay, now is it true, uh, SP, as I shall call her, is it true that a diabetic person does not live as long as a non-diabetic of the same age? organized maybe you could just tell us um, first you got very nice slides but unfortunately the slides are not up maybe I can get you to talk about something else how do you diagnose diabetes how do you know you're diabetic Often people measure their HbA1c. Can that be used to diagnose diabetes as well? Yes, we can use HbA1c to make the diagnosis. And the level that we are considering as diabetic is more than 6.5%. Okay. So if, you have, if you have no diabetes, you have no symptoms of diabetes, no symptoms uh, like having thirst, then you have to have two abnormal levels before you are considered as being diabetic. But if you have symptoms, then one level is good enough. Okay, so, so I would have to have at least two blood samples uh, before showing an elevated sugar before I can be considered a diabetic. Coming back to, you know, often in the labs, if your sugar is more than 5.6 or 5.7, they begin to highlight it and people get scared. You know, am I diabetic? Am I diabetic? So what is your comments when people put 5.6 and above as um, indicating diabetes? Um, when they flag 5.6, it means that it is abnormal. 
most people who are non-diabetic have fasting glucose levels below 5.6, meaning 5.5 and below. Above 5.6, it is considered as abnormal. It's only above 7 that you are considered to have a diabetic level of glucose. So between 5.6 to 6.9, that is the level that we consider as not normal, not diabetic. We could call this intermediate state pre-diabetes. Okay, so now that you got your slides up, maybe you could answer this question. I got a bit frightened when you said that a diabetic person does not live as long as a non-diabetic. Maybe you can show me what you mean. Okay, I'm going to try it again. Here you are. If you are a Malaysian person who has no diabetes and no heart disease, you are really expected to live another 20 years. So I've given you 20 birthday cakes. Unfortunately, from this publication, looking at uh, collaboration of multiple studies across the world, including Asian populations, they found and were able to analyze and said, if you have diabetes today at the age of 60, you lose six years of life. Life. So let me take you expected to live another 14 years. If you have diabetes and heart disease, you lose another six years, which means you have another eight years more to live. So instead of expecting to live for another 20 years, you have lost 12 of those years. That's really very bad news. So 68 rather than my 80. I think that's too much. Okay. All right. But, you know, this is Western population, Western figures. And, you know, is it really applicable to our country? Uh, because when people look at a lot of data, they always say that it is not applicable to Malaysians. So is this data applicable to Malaysians? Yes, it is applicable to Malaysians because, as I said, this data is uh, culled from multiple studies uh, around the world, which means that there were Asian populations that were used in uh, analyzing this data and coming up with these numbers. Okay. Now, I mean, this is a bit frightening, but how common is this diabetes in Malaysia? Is this something that I need to be worried about? Unfortunately, um, okay, this is a picture that I, uh, just to show that diabetes, if you are diabetic and you don't look after yourself, it steals years of your life. The, com the prevalence of diabetes has been found to be 18%, 18% in the last census that was done in 2019. This was in population above the age of 18, considered as adults, right? And so that actually translates to one in five adult Malaysians. One in five adult Malaysians have diabetes. But it depends on your age as well. So let me just show you these few slides. If you are between the age of 40 to 50, two out of 10 Malaysians have diabetes. So if you look at that uh, darkened uh, uh, little, uh, let me just call out my laser pointer easier. Okay, two out of 10 have diabetes. If you are between the age of 50 and 60, three out of 10 Malaysians have diabetes. If you are above the age of 60, four out of 10 have diabetes. And really, it is incredible numbers. And we have worked out that it almost 4 million of our 35 million Malaysians above the age of 18 have diabetes in Malaysia. Wow, that's a lot. It looks like almost every family of five one may end up being a diabetic. Is yes. there an ethnic preponderance? Yes, unfortunately, uh, the Indian population ethnic group appears to have the highest prevalence of about 30% and then followed by the Malay, which is about 20-odd uh, percent, and then the Chinese. So, um, unfortunately, whatever happens, we have double-digit prevalence of diabetes and we probably are the champion in this region. Is it hereditary? It is hereditary. So if you have a parent who has diabetes, you are likely to have diabetes about 20% uh, chance of being diabetic uh, in your lifetime. Is it father, mother or any? Anyone. If you have both father, mother, lagi Oh, that means 40%. 
<laughs> no, no, probably not 40%, but certainly more than 20%. And if you have brothers and sisters also, also I think you're waiting, you're like a time bomb waiting uh, to, to explode. So all in the family. Yes, okay. unfortunately. And what age eh, normally do you, do they develop diabetes if you're going to develop diabetes? From our senses, we real recognize that a, around 40 years of age is the mean, they call the average age at which people are recognized to be diabetic. But uh, I showed you, isn't it? Uh, let me just go backwards and let's focus on this slide, remember? Okay, so if you were 30 to 40 years of age, one in 10 Malaysians would be diabetic. And even below the age of 30, that comes to 6%. How does that translate to 1 in 20 people below the age of 30 have diabetes? 1 in 20 is not a small number. So although the mean age we say is 40, but we have a lot of people with diabetes below the age of 40, which we consider as very young. You, can, you think about it, Jaya, if that person is diabetic at, at 25, that person is likely to live with diabetes for the next 40 years of his or her life. It's going to be a very long duration of living with diabetes. Okay, you're, you're referring to type 2 diabetes, I think. Am Absolutely. I correct? Correct. Absolutely. Okay, the, the, now, sorry. Type 1 diabetes is very rare in Malaysia. 99% of our patients have type 2 diabetes. Okay, now, I'm a bit worried that there's so close relationship between diabetes and, and death. And you know, like you say, steal, diabetes steals your life. Why? Why does diabetes steal one's life? What are the common causes for this? Right. And that is, again, brings us to the title of this conversation today, right? That diabetes costs everybody, their lives and their livelihoods, as well as quality and quantity of life. So what has been, again, documented is that people with diabetes, two out of three will die of a heart complication, whether it is a heart attack, heart failure, or even a stroke. And it is, as mentioned earlier on in this discussion, uh, the cause of early mortality, meaning earlier than expected. So three out of two out of three deaths will be because of cardiovascular disease. Not because of kidney problem, not because of uh, amputations, not of losing limbs. Not so much. And that's the reason why, uh, in a way, this is a wake up call for everyone because there is a big underestimation of diabetes as the cause of people having earlier than expected heart attacks, heart failure, strokes. So if you want to show, talk, talk about this data that I have been just showing, Jaya, this is from the Cardiovascular Cardiac uh, Association. Okay, well, you can see this is from the National Cardiovascular Database and it looked at everybody who had a heart attack and they tried to find out which were the risk factors which were highest in prevalence in these patients. As you can see right on top there is high blood pressure at 63% and number two place is diabetes. And let's not forget our third sister, high cholesterol, one in three. So that they say, tiga sakawan. Right. So in a way, if you think about it, Jaya, uh, the diabetic patient here, one in every two of the heart attack patients in the coronary care units have diabetes. But you must remember, it come, a lot of diabetic patients have high blood pressure as well, and they also have high cholesterol. Can you imagine your tiga sakawan all in one go? You're going to have, again, a much higher risk for heart disease as well as possibly stroke, right? right. What other vessels are, Jaya, are affected apart from the one that's supplying the heart, supplying the brain? Basically, okay, this is uh, an angiogram that I think it will be nice for you to see what diabetes does to the blood vessel. Uh, Dr. Chan, can you please uh, play the first thing for me? Okay, I'm going to try if I can. Oops. Oopsie. 
I can't. Uh, no, you I can't, can't use the pointer. You have to use the other. Oh, yeah. Get rid of the pointer uh -huh. first. Let's get rid of pointers. Right. See what, ah, here we go. Ah, there you go. Okay. The first is an angiogram of a normal person. Stop it. Okay. Wait, let it run again and stop it halfway where they can look at what a normal angiogram. Stop, stop. Okay. Let's look at the second angiogram. Yes. Let's run that. Stop. Ah. Uh -oh. <laughs> Gostan. Gostan. Okay. Lost All it. right. Run again the first angiogram. And stop it. Okay. Second. And stop it. Okay. The angiogram on the left is actually of a 66 year old woman. Look at her arteries, big, nice, as clean. As I often tell my patients, smooth as a baby's backside. The one on the left, uh, I'm sorry, on the right, is actually only a 44-year-old woman who was only knew she was diabetic three months before this angiogram was done. She came in with heart failure. Look at it. You can't see the vessels. They're all little tiny threads running around. And even the only big thread there has already got a bad narrowing the artery. So this is what diabetes does to you. It does, this is what we can see in the vessels of the heart. But it can affect blood vessels anyway. Next slide, please. It can affect your brain. Okay, it can affect the heart. I told you, it causes a heart attack. It causes heart failure. And in fact, the lady that I showed you came in with heart failure. And people couldn't believe that it was her arteries were that bad. It can affect the brain. Okay, stroke, everybody knows. But do you know that it, this diabetes can, is also a cause for dementia? It, the small, small blood vessels get blocked. And then you can come up with forgetting who you are, forgetting your passwords, forgetting your account number of your safe, everything puts you. Okay? Of course, it can affect your legs and you can either get an ulcer or you can get an amputation. And the same thing affecting your kidney, you get proteinuria and you can end up eventually with kidney failure. So that's it. It's a bad polyvascular disease. So, Jaya, this you are just talking about the heart and the brain where it is due to blockage of the large blood vessels that are supplying our major organs, namely the heart and the brain. And for the kidneys and the legs, it is um, multiple problems, isn't it? It's due to blockage of the small, small vessels. vessels. In fact, the dementia is also believed to be blockage of small vessels. So a stroke, you know, but as your brain, little by little, you begin to forget even uh, important things. That's your diabetes causing the little blood vessels in the brain to get knocked off. And I suppose one of the pride, uh, em points to emphasize is that it is affecting them at a younger age, isn't it? As like you just showed us, that young 44-year-old woman who's got arteries that look a lot older than the 66-year-old woman that you compared with. So this is called multi-infarct dementia due to severe atherosclerotic disease as opposed to Alzheimer's dementia, which you see in an older age group. All right. So how do you break this link? I mean, this is frightening. How do I look after myself? I'm a diabetic. How do I prevent me from losing my brain, my cuckoo? I'm getting cuckoo. How? Right. Uh that's really what we are here about, not to just frighten everybody, although we do need to lay down the bare facts of being diabetic and not being able to control or not controlling all the risk factors that we as doctors recognize as causing all these complications that we have just outlined for you between myself and Dr. Jaya. So first, things first. You cannot do anything with regards to diabetes uh, without changing your lifestyle. 
So as I've shown here, you hope that the person who has diabetes will not be too big sized, obese or overweight. And the way to do it would be on the right and the left of this cartoon, which would be to increase your physical activity and to make that bowl of rice smaller so that actually you'll end up losing a bit of weight. So lifestyle is very important. Right, we cannot just say, Doctor, Doctor Jaya, Doctor Chan, give me medicine and I'll be fine. So that's uh, something that you have to remember. You have to change your lifestyle. The other way to break the link is to re recognize that diabetes is not just sugar alone, right? Although sugar, as you and I just heard just now, the way we reckon, we sort of look at how well your sugar is controlled is by this term called A1C. This blood test that we do once in every three to six months gives the doctor an idea of how well your sugar is controlled over the last six uh, three months. And so the question we need to try and improve glucose control, but we also know that diabetes came with what Dr. Jaya say, Tiga Sakawan. It comes with high blood glucose, uh, blood pressure, as well as high cholesterol. So, Dr. Jaya, how do you think the patient should be able to control their blood pressure and their cholesterol? Okay, again, it, lifestyle is number one. If you reduce weight, your blood pressure will come down. But many of these patients do need effective blood pressure medicines and number two you must take it just looking at the blood pressure tablet or looking at the cholesterol tablet is not enough you must take it and put it in your mouth and most of these medicines are very well tolerated they have hardly have any side effects if there is a side effect bring it to the attention of the doctor so that they can actually change it to something else which is more suitable for you i mean so some medicines are very effective, but you may not tolerate it. Whereas another patient may be able to tolerate it. So discuss with the doctor. Don't decide, ah, yeah, this medicine is lousy. I don't want it. Okay. Yes, Dr. Chan has said, you must know your numbers. A1C, D for blood pressure, C for cholesterol. And the numbers, Dr. Chan, huh? Can you show us the numbers? The A, B, C. Okay, you start first with the sugar. A1C should be less than 7%. In order to get the A1C less than 7%, you need your fasting glucose to be less than 7 And two hours after food should be less than, depending on how tight a control you want, it can be less than 8.5 if you want to be really, really kiasu. Or if you're saying, yeah, doctor, you know, I'm already 65, 70 years old, give chance lah. And maybe allow it to go down up, up to 10, but not more than 10. So those are the glucose numbers. So now, Dr. Jaya, what about the blood pressure numbers? Okay. Now, it is very, very important. Blood pressure should be less than 140, 90, and the cholesterol should be in diabetics. The LDL, we look at LDL, the bad cholesterol, the LDL, and it will depend. If you are just a diabetic, your LDL should be less than 2.6. If you are a very high risk person, that means you are a diabetic who already has an established cardiovascular disease, already have narrowing in the arteries or strokes, or a below knee amputation or whatever, the LDL cholesterol should be less than 1.4. Now, I want to highlight something. When these patients with diabetes develop cardiovascular complication, it is not really the level of sugar that actually prevents that or causes the diabetes. Uh, the, the cardiovascular event. What is more important is the other kawan in the family, the cholesterol and the blood pressure. So you must remember that the level of cholesterol, which is okay for a non-diabetic, maybe your wife is non-diabetic and she has an LDL of 3 or 2.7 and the doctor will pat her and say, excellent, Mrs. XYZ. And then they turn to you who are a diabetic who also has an LDL of 2.8. He will say, this is bad. You already got heart disease and you have diabetes. It should come down 
less than 1.4. So the level for one person is not the same as the other. It depends upon your risk. And I keep on telling my patients again and again, it is not the sugar that causes the cardiovascular, the not the sugar that causes the heart attack. It is the level of the cholesterol. It is the level of the blood pressure. So please, when the government hospital gives you the blood the cholesterol medicine, oh, I only am a vegetarian. So the cholesterol medicine can give the dog. The rest of the medicine, I think, cannot. The most important there is the cholesterol medicine. You keep the LDL as low as possible. The other thing some people say is your LDL is less than one. Are you a doctor? I need the cholesterol for whatever reason. Less than one is safe. It has been tried in many studies that you keep your LDL less than one, 0 0.8. It is still safe. You're not going to have an impotency or you're not going to drop dead just because your LDL is very low. Okay? In fact, newborns have an LDL of 1. So, and they are the ones who need the LDL cholesterol for growing cells, etc. So, I can assure you having an LDL of less than 1 also is very safe. So, please take the medicine. If the statin is causing you some concern, discuss it with the doctor. The biggest concern people have is does it affect my kidney? No. It does not affect the kidney. The only thing it does, it, some people it causes muscle aches. If it does cause muscle aches, again discuss with the doctor. They can actually or take, change it to some other medications or they can use some other combinations we are, which are as effective and which can keep you comfortable. Coming back to blood pressure, I've also told you the same thing. In fact, the lower the blood pressure in a diabetic, it is better. Although we aim for less than 140 and the diastolic less than 90, if it comes down to 110 and you're feeling fine, it is ideal. So don't come and say, oh, my blood pressure is 110 by 70, doctor. Do I need to reduce my medicine? No. You only need to reduce your medication if the systolic is less than 90 or you begin to feel very dizzy. Whenever you stand up, you feel like falling down. Then you have to discuss with the doctor again. Maybe you need to decrease the dose. But it is something you must discuss with your doctor, not something you should do by yourself. Because it is these other members of the family which are actually causing more of the harm rather than the sugar. Sugar actually is just the, the bad guy. But the real bad guys, the ones with the guns, are the blood pressure and the cholesterol. Am I correct, SP? The blood pressure and cholesterol are the machine guns. The glucose is the pea shooter. So I can't say that the glucose is not important. After all, I look after these patients with diabetes. Uh, remember that <clears throat> glucose uh, does play a part in the overall risk for a patient to have uh, the heart disease, the stroke. Uh, but remember just now, Jaya was also talking about the small capillary, the small blood supply, the microvascular complications. Uh, that Those are the complications that are badly affected by poor glucose control. So the problem of having kidney disease, the protein in the urine, kidney failure, the nerves in the feet that don't feel so well, with numbness uh, and so that getting this uh, risk of having ulcers and amputation, those are all the damage to the microscopic small blood vessels that will cause those complications. So diabetes and glucose does contribute to the patient's ill health. But as you, as you just heard from Jaya, the ones with the the, the machine guns causing the damage are the blood pressure and the cholesterol. And again, just to remind everybody that just because you're diabetic doesn't mean that you're just focused on your sugar alone. We need to treat your A, B, C. But again, one more thing that we have recently recognized when we ran a diabetes survey is that a lot of Malaysians have a bit of misunderstanding. They think that if they just stop taking sugar, that the diabetes will go away. Unfortunately, that is not correct. 
we have many patients where they are, you know, literally just eating hardly any carbohydrates and going on this unfortunately unbalanced diet that where the diabetes remains difficult to control. So it, diabetes is not so simple to, to control as people think, Jaya. They think, doctor, I don't eat rice and I don't drink sugar. Why my sugar is still so high? So for these patients, they may require medication in order to actually control this A1C that we are talking about. Yeah, it's the same with cholesterol too. They say, look, I, I'm a vegetarian. I don't touch meat. Why? Why do I need statins? Yeah, because diet only contributes to 15 to 20% of the cholesterol in the diet. Most of your cholesterol is produced by your liver. So that's why at one time, the, in fact, it is the American Diabetic, uh, the, the American Association has actually come out to say that dietary cholesterol is not really that important because it contributes only so little to the cholesterol in your blood. Blood cholesterol is important and most of it is coming from your liver. So you can eat what you want, but please take your medicine to cut down liver production. Okay, I mean, you have given me all those frightening things about diabetes and uh, the Tiga Sakawan and Umpat Sakawan. How can I prevent myself from getting diabetes? You know, let's go even backwards. I think that is actually a very important point to make this afternoon. As we just heard earlier on in the introduction, that we have such a high proportion, high percentage of our population with diabetes 18%, meaning one in five adults have diabetes and it runs in families. So automatically you look in anybody with a family history, they are likely to have inherited the gene for developing diabetes. So in order to prevent yourself from becoming diabetic, I think this would be the way I can show it to you. If this person, you can see big, nice, round, doesn't mean necessarily healthy, right? He will have a high risk of diabetes just because he has put on a lot of weight, just because he has lived living with a very unhealthy lifestyle, no exercise whatsoever, working from home, WFH, uh, running away from COVID-19, uh, no chance to go to the gym because the gym is dangerous and uh, uh, highly infectious, right? So you have to find other ways in order to try and exercise safely. So you've got to increase your physical activity and you need to decrease that bowl of rice so that you can try and get yourself down to this size in order to try and prevent yourself from becoming diabetic. You, as you heard from Jia, you cannot run away from your genetics, your parents, you cannot change, right? You cannot run away from getting older. That's another risk factor. So genetics in terms of family risk, uh, getting older, you cannot change. But these things that I've just shown you in this slide is what you can try and have some control over. And it has been shown very clearly through research. And that research has been going on not only in the Western population, as Jaya asked in the past, there's also been proven in the Chinese population in China, where they put the patients in with high risk of diabetes, with what they call pre-diabetes, the sugars are in between diabetic numbers and uh, normal numbers. They, they gave them a very good lifestyle, lost weight, and they actually prevented diabetes by 50%. So it can be done. It doesn't mean that you cannot outrun your genes. You cannot outrun your age, I suppose, Jaya. So the, the common question that I hear is, can I reverse my diabetes? If I baru dapat kencing manis, can I reverse the diabetes? And the answer is yes, if you look like this person. If you're overweight, unhealthy, no, no exercise, nothing, if you lose weight and look like this, you can actually put diabetes in remission, meaning you may not even need medicine to control your sugar. But if you then gain weight and get older, the diabetes will come back, right? But if you actually are already diabetic and you're already a normal size, 
don't try and lose anymore because there's nothing much to lose. So the answer is if you have got a normal weight and you are unlucky to be diabetic, you may not be able to put your diabetes in remission. You may require medicine for control. Do you get my, my message, Jaya? So basically, you're trying to tell me that it is all just not uh, diet and I cannot control. Some people may be able to control with diet, lifestyle and weight loss. But a lot of, um, but a lot of people with diabetes who are thin cannot be, um, you know, you know they, they cannot yep. reverse their diabetes. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Because they think that if they go on this fancy ketogenic diet or no low, no carb diet, that they can then reverse their diabetes. Unfortunately, uh, in these in circumstances, uh, it's not going to work. So the answer is not sort of like one size fits all. Weight loss will fit some people, but weight loss will not be effective for some others. Okay. Let us assume that you know, I'm a mother, I'm a diabetic mother, and I am now pregnant. How can I, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I have to pass some of these genes to my children. How can I prevent them from developing diabetes? Or is there anything that I can do? Right. Again, uh, you said the right thing. If you have diabetes, um, you will have passed your genetic risk to them. But how can you prevent them from get, becoming diabetic? Then basically, it's a healthy lifestyle that you will try and encourage them to, uh, to continue to live a healthy lifestyle from childhood. Um, what you are trying to say is what happens if the woman has a um, difficult pregnancy where there are problems uh, with nutrition, then some that has been found in when there are difficult times in war times basically they found that the pregnant woman who is poorly uh, poor nutrition that they these young uh, babies grow up to adults with a higher risk of developing what they call cardiometabolic problems like diabetes hypertension and heart disease so Nutrition in pregnancy is important. Uh, and if you unfortunately have that risk, that genetic risk, again, the healthy lifestyle is the answer to prevention. Okay. So, um, all right. Now, I'm still waiting to see if there are any questions from our listeners. It's either that you are very, very clear, Dr. Chan, or... Maybe they're too so, frightened. You talk too much. You frighten them. Hopefully not. Uh, hopefully they'll be interested to see whether or not they can do something. Um, the, what we have gone through so far is that <clears throat> diabetes is very common, that it comes with friends, the tiga sakawan that is not invited, pun datang. So you need to manage it carefully. And if you manage it, all the ABC, you will reduce your chance of developing complications and from losing the years of life that I showed you. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe, again, JL, it would be a, perhaps appropriate for us to talk about uh, COVID-19 since you and I are doing this on uh, online, uh, that we are not facing our, our audience is because of this pandemic that all of us are living uh, with for the last almost, well, one and a half years or more, uh, that if you are unlucky enough to be diabetic uh, and catch the COVID infection, you are three times more, three times more, more likely to develop severe COVID, needing to be admitted to hospital, needing ICU care, and three times more likely to die of COVID if you are not well controlled. So what is the message here? If you have diabetes, try and get your diabetes well controlled. Try and get your blood pressure well controlled. Because if you have all these issues that are not well controlled just because you're hiding in the house doesn't mean that they are well controlled, 
right? Uh, and that it will increase your risk of having a severe COVID with bad outcomes if you don't take care. So in fact, there was a question, did, did COVID-19 will worse if I had a diabetes? Yes, the answer is yes, especially oh. if it's not well controlled. Now, the other question uh, is why I sometimes doze off, uh, in, usually in the afternoons. Right, that is a different problem altogether. Uh, we have to find out there are several reasons why you can feel very sleepy in the afternoon. Sometimes it's because you've eaten a very heavy lunch, but most of the time, most of the time, it's what we have we call obstructive sleep apnea. So these tend to be people who are overweight or obese. So during sleep, they don't have good quality sleep, what we call good re REM sleep. Uh, and therefore, their sleep is interrupted and we call it fractured. So in the, in the night, they wake up and then go back to sleep, wake up and go back to sleep. That's because they have these episodes of sleep apnea where the breathing stops for a short while. And because of this fractured sleep, they don't have good quality sleep. And then in the daytime, they feel very sleepy. And that's when it becomes dangerous. Uh, because if you happen to be driving, uh, and you fall asleep on the wheel, that's a major cause for accidents. Right. Okay. Now, one of the things is, I think the question was, you know, usually after you have a big lunch, especially a rice lunch, bada bam, you want to go for siesta. Is it any connection with the rice or the carbohydrate diet? It's not really so much with the rice or carbohydrate diet. It's more likely to do with the... You see, we do know physiologically that if you've eaten a big meal, that a lot of your blood supply goes to your stomach in order to handle the, the big amount of food that you've just makan, all right? And so when all the blood supply has gone to your stomach, then very less goes to your brain. That's the reason why you, fall, you are sleepy. Um, I'm not sure that unless you've taken a huge amount of sugar uh, uh, that increases your sugar, sugar very high that it will cause you to be that sleepy it's really even non-diabetic people are sleepy after they've taken a heavy meal so it's not necessarily due to the rice it's not necessarily due to uh, the sugars that are going up after eating okay is it better to take drinks like glucina and oat bran at night or taking two eggs some veggies because meal replacement tends to contain more sugar well, that's wrong. I don't think meal replacements contain sugar. Otherwise, it wouldn't be allowed in our recommendation. Meal replacements are very well balanced uh, in terms of giving you the nutrients that you need and a balance between carbohydrate, protein and fiber uh, and the meal replacement really is supposed to take the place of a meal. And that's the reason why it's called that. Um, so the, these meal replacements are low in calories. So if, if you, instead of eating a meal, you take this, if you take this in the long run, you will lose weight. I don't think if you are taking a low calorie diet, you necessarily need to have a meal replacement. We don't rec really say that everybody should go on a meal replacement. It's a matter of discipline. If you can say, I can limit the amount of calories that I eat, the amount of carbohydrate in that meal, then by all means, take a low calorie diet that is as good as a meal replacement. So we don't need to have everyone go on um, these nutrition drinks that have been specifically uh, made for people with diabetes uh, because you can just do it with your, your own diet. The only problem, Jaya, is that many people are not as disciplined as we want them to be. And so they tend to overeat. So the other, only other way is, okay, if you cannot stop eating, then just eat this little bit. Okay. I, I think you are, did answer this question. Once you start on medication, does it mean it has to be taken for life? You did answer that, but you may just want to repeat that. Okay, the answer is, it's not, again, one answer will fit everything. You may require, let's say you look like this person, which I am showing here on this slide. If you're already normal size and you need 
medication in order to control your glucose, in order to keep everything under control, then you may require it for life. If you are very big size and you become very fit and you lose 10 to 15 kilograms of that excess weight, then you may be able to cut back on a lot of these diabetes medicines. Some patients, we call it in remission, may not need medication. Some will require some smaller doses of uh, medications that don't cause the glucose to go too low. So you may be able to cut back on the number of medicines that you need to take. So not sort of like one answer will fit everybody. Okay, the next question actually is something about liver. Now, it is um, what our liver does, therefore, what should we do to address the liver to help control the diabetes? No, I think what I meant, what I said was the liver contributes a lot of the cholesterol and uh, what you eat does only contributes 10 to 15% of the cholesterol in your blood. Most of the cholesterol in the blood is from the liver. And how can we improve the liver health? Again, by reducing your weight, cutting down your sugar, cutting down your alcohol, it improves your liver fat, uh, fats and make it a bit more healthy. Okay. Now, um, has the range for blood glucose levels changed? That means to 5.5. Uh, this was asked by Juliana. You, you addressed this earlier, but you may just want to say something about this 5.5, fasting blood sugar of 5.5. So let's get back to the basics. For us to make a diagnosis of diabetes, the numbers are different. For you to control your diabetes, the numbers are different. So in order for you to be diagnosed as diabetic, a fasting glucose level of more than 7 a postprandial or after eating or random glucose sample of above 11, these are the numbers that we say you have diabetes, 7, 11. If you use A1C, it's 6.5%. For you, if you are diabetic, then we look at different ranges in order for us to say that you are well controlled. As I've shown you, maybe if I try and go back, know your numbers, here we go. Fasting, that means before food, should be less than seven. Two hours after food, depending on how aggressive the control needs to be, it can be 8.5 or 10. So the lowest number that we want is no less than 4.5. Less than 4.5, people will get a little bit hungry. I'm not sure what you asked about 5.5. That is perhaps people who are not diabetic and you want to know whether I have a normal glucose level or whether I have a pre-diabetic level or I have a diabetic level. So I said diabetic level is 7. Normal level is 5.5. And 5.6 to 6.9 is pre-diabetic. I, I see. hope I yeah. yeah, I think you have made it very clear. Yes, somebody asked, will diabetes make us blind? Yes, poorly controlled diabetes, yes, certainly can make, cause blindness. The other question is a bit more interesting. Taking metformin will deplete B12 vitamin. Will this cause nerve damage even faster, leading to amputations? answer is absolutely, absolutely not. Okay. This is a concern for patients who are taking metformin for donkey's years. And even after they've taken it for donkey's years, we have looked at B12 levels in some of our patients and have not come across B12 deficiency as the cause for nerve problems, right? So although this is a theoretical risk for people who are taking metformin, we have not come across this problem frequently and in fact it's rare. So rather than blame B12 as the cause of the nerve damage, the most common cause of nerve damage is poor diabetes control. Poor diabetes control for years and years. If you have had diabetes for 10 years, 15 years, or you may even have had diabetes where you did not know, and then today you found that you have diabetes, you may have actually been, have been diabetic for years because you didn't go and check, all right? 
So these years of high glucose are the cause of the small vessel damage that have in, at, affected your small nerves so that you are numb in your feet. And because your feet are numb, you don't protect your feet. So you step on something sharp and you did not realize you hurt yourself. In the night when you wake up, say, how come there's blood on my bed? And you look at your foot and you see a thumbtack there or something crazy. And that's because you don't protect your feet. And this nerve damage is because of years of poor glucose control. Okay, what about hand shaking and cold sweat suddenly coming on? I think it's an indication of low sugar. Absolutely. Um, if you have cold sweats, you feel suddenly very hungry, you are shaking and you feel a little bit giddy, that sounds like your glucose is getting low. So you need to find out whether it may be due to some of the medications that you are taking, especially if you're on insulin or you're on some sulfonylurea drugs like we call glycoside or glibenclamide. These medicines stimulate your body to make insulin. And so again, if you are taking some of these medicines, talk to your doctor, find out what it does to your body in terms of improving your glucose control. So my usual advice to patients is if you're on these medications, you cannot miss your meal. You have to eat your meals on time because these medicines will stimulate your body to push out insulin. And if insulin comes out and there's no food, so how not to have your glucose going low? So that's the problem. Some patients say, come back to me and say, doctor, doctor, you just, just scolded me for my sugar being high. So I went home and I puasa. I don't eat because you just scolded me. I said, oh, please, lie. I didn't ask you not to eat. I didn't ask you to starve. So again, remember how the medicines work and you need to work together with your medicines to control your glucose. Okay, if one is a diabetic already on medication and the fasting blood sugar level is around 7.2 upon waking up in the morning. Number one, are you happy or what can you do about it? All right. Uh, there are many reasons why you wake up with a fasting glucose of above 7. As I said, so showed you, right? Um, You're seeing the slide here. The level you want to aim at is to be less than 7 when you wake, right? First of all, find out why the sugar is high. Maybe you had a nice makan supper the night before, then you have your answer. But you say, no, no, doc, it wakes, I wake up with above seven even when I eat like normal, I do my exercise like you told me to, I, I've been good girl, good boy. Uh, then you have to go back and talk to your doctor so that they can adjust your medicine so that you can try and get your glucose to less than seven when you wake. There are many medications we can try and work on to, to, to fit your your type of diabetes. So I cannot give you a magic answer. You need to go back and discuss this with your doctor. But seven, when you wake up above seven, is not where you want to be. Okay. In fact, there's another question similar. Diabetic for more than 20 years, A1C of 6.5, but morning sugar is 9. How to lower the morning sugar? Okay, the, this is actually a very good question. When you have diabetes that is longer than 10, 15 years and yours is 20 years, most of the time it is because your body is not making enough insulin because your pancreas, which is the factory that makes insulin, is starting to become bankrupt. So when your insulin is not coming out, right, in the night, what is stopping your glucose from rising is that your liver, which is the store of your sugar, is releasing sh sugar into the bloodstream. And most of us, the liver will release a small amount so that we, your levels don't go too low when you are not eating. But the person who has diabetes, whose pancreas is not functioning so well, the liver is releasing too much of it so that you, when you wake up, the level is too high. In this instance, you will probably require a small dose of long-acting insulin given at bedtime in order to stop your liver from releasing that glucose. Is there any fruits we need to avoid to prevent the increase in glucose level? Example, bananas, mangoes, can eat or not? Very good question. You can eat almost any fruit. The answer is, if you can stop, then you can start. 
If you cannot stop, don't start. That is my motto, right? You can eat a small banana the size of an amas. Anything bigger is too many calories unless you're taking the banana as part of your exercise regime. If you want to take a small fruit like an apple or an orange or a pear, it has to be the size of, say, maybe the size of a tennis ball, easy to remember, all right? If it is anything bigger than a tennis ball, then it's too much at any one go. You have to cut it in half, share it with somebody else, or you take half at lunch and half at dinner. The key is you cannot eat too much at one go because your body, as you know it, is diabetic and you cannot handle too much fruit sugar. Fruit sugar is a carbohydrate. It contributes to sugar. If you eat too much of it, the glucose will rise. So a lot of misunderstanding is, oh, it's fruit, ah, so it must be safe. Wrong. Right. Even worse, many of my patients come and say, doctor, doctor, I believe in fruit juice. Lagi worse. You are allowed to take the fruit in the natural form with all the fiber to slow down the way you absorb the sugar. If you squeeze out the juice, throw away the fiber, how much will be in one glass of fruit, fruit juice? Easily about three to four fruits without the fiber. Your sugar will be up in the ceiling. So no fruit juice. Okay, the next question actually is in Malay, but I think uh, we can uh, put it in Malay. Saya nak tahu jika ada contoh fizikal yang boleh memberitahu seseorang itu adalah mengidap diabetik. For example, kulit limau atau kulit mengerutu di bahagian peha itu adalah sebab lemak dan diabetik. Betul ke? Then she's talking about cellulite, I think, on the legs. Cellulite? Yes. No, the, there's uh, no... There's dot, 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 dot things, you know, the fat with the dots. So, I... <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to answer in English, yeah? Um, if you have cellulite and all this excess accumulation of fat in your thighs and the rest of your body, it really just means you have too much fat overall. So, if you are overall too fat, then there's a high chance that you will develop diabetes, right? Um, if you are talking about, if you senang dapat, how do you call it, bisul, uh, you get infection like boils and infections in the skin, that may be a thunder that your sugar is high. Because when your sugar is high, your immunity is poor. That means your ability to fight any infection like kuman-kuman on in the skin will be poorer. So senang dapat bisul. Senang dapat bisul in the arms and the legs and even in the private area. Uh, a lot of people are very embarrassed to talk about it. So I'm not sure what your question is, but if you get a lot of frequent boils, infections in the skin, then you might need to know, find out whether you're diabetic. If you're not already diabetic, if you're diabetic, that means your sugar is not well controlled. Okay, how much of a carbohydrate should we take daily to maintain, maintain the normal glucose level? I think this is... A... <coughs> um, I think, again, very difficult to answer. We just tell our patients, again, it depends on what your size is. Yeah, you showed, I showed you earlier on already, isn't it? Kalau besar, you actually have to make your bowl of rice smaller. Kalau kecil, then you have to eat one bowl of rice. So it depends on how much activity you do. Kalau you... You could do, uh, gardening or you go and do a lot of uh, hard work and uh, then you might be able to take one bowl of rice per meal. But if you like office worker, you sit down in front of your computer, then perhaps if you want to, if your doctor is asking you to advise you to eat, to eat less, to cut down your body weight, then about... Uh, a half of the bowl of rice or two-thirds of a bowl of rice will be what is good enough. Okay, now this one is uh, something about someone fainting. Someone who has diabetes, collapse, faint, even though after food, he does a physical activity and he collapses and faint. He's a diabetic. What is your comment? I so don't know. I la. think this one, uh, you need to exclude cardiovascular disease, You need to go and see the heart yeah. of specialist. You can't just say it's because yeah. of your sugar. You need to I don't think so. other cows, cows. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The other one says, what vitamin is good for liver health? And uh, someone again asks, how can you improve liver health? 
Very good question. Uh, we know that people with diabetes tend to be overweight and obese. And when you are diabetic, overweight and obese, you have a much higher, about 50, 60% of these people have what we call fatty liver. And the way to improve fatty liver, listen, yeah, the way to improve fatty liver is lose weight. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. That's the hospital announcement. If the way to improve fatty liver, lose weight, eat less carbohydrate, carbohydrate, and increase your physical activity, that will fix your fatty liver. Fat in the liver is not because of fat in the diet. Fat in the liver is because too much carbohydrate in the diet. Lose weight, increase your physical activity, eat less carbohydrate. Don't go and buy all the expensive liver tonics and stuff like that. They, those have not been um, found scientifically to be effective in improving fatty liver. What I've just told you has scientific background to and scientific proof to improve fatty liver. Lose weight. But don't lose like 500 grams or 200 grams. Huh? We are talking about losing about 5 kilograms to 10 kilograms of body weight. Okay, someone says, my husband has got diabetes for more than 30 years and he's on insulin and he has dark patches and his whole body is itchy and he has seen many doctors. They say it's just due to diabetes. Uh, so why do diabetic patients have a lot of itchiness and a lot of balls and stuff on their skin? Um, several things. One, as I've said already, when your sugar is high, your, your immunity is poor, so you'll have a higher risk of developing any kind of infection, including skin infections, boils, abscesses, and things like that. Second is, if your sugar is high, in itself, just a high sugar will make your skin itchy. So that's the second reason why the skin is itchy. Um, and the dark spots are due to the, the diabetes damage to the skin and the pigmentation is due to the damage, damage by, of diabetes. So 30 years suggest that he is having um, very long duration of diabetes. The key now to improving everything is to improve your glucose control. And most of what you are complaining of should improve. Okay, is parboil rice good for a diabetic? The answer is any kind of carbohydrate that has got high fiber content with what we call low glycemic index, meaning it doesn't increase your sugar really very high, will be good for you. So there are many versions of rice that actually have what we call low glycemic index. Parboiled rice is one of these. The others are multigrain rice, unpolished rice, basmati rice, just not the Thai fragrant rice. That is the, probably the worst of the lot. But remember, even if you take parboiled rice, if you take a mountain of it, punta bolela is also the quantity also. Okay, there are two more questions that I will allow because of the question of time. One is related to thyroid and diabetes. Is thyroid related with diabetes and this hormone disorders can cause diabetes, thyroid disease? Mm, I haven't heard this question before. Thyroid and diabetes are not connected. So maybe that's an easy question. Um, um, we have hundreds of hormones in the body, not just thyroid hormone or diabetes, insulin. We've got so many other hormones. Uh, they're not connected, please. Okay. Uh, the last one is somebody, late father, three siblings have diabetes and uh, it seems to be inherited in the family. How can I avoid, stop this? How can I prevent myself from getting diabetes? You can try, you may not be able to outrun diabetes because your genetics is so bad. So the key would be to check your sugar, check your A1C. And if you actually have such a high risk, uh, try and keep your weight down and blah, 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 as I mentioned all this last one hour. If you do an A1C or you sometimes we do an oral glucose tolerance test, meaning we make you drink a glu uh, a cup of glucose and then check your sugar two, late, two hours later. And if we find that you have what we call pre-diabetes, some doctors, including myself, 
will recommend that you start taking medication to prevent the glucose from rising to diabetic level. This is another way that we can do it. Improving your lifestyle may even consider taking some medications to prevent yourself from becoming diabetic. You look like a sitting duck because uh, everybody else in your family is diabetic. Okay, in the interest of time, in fact, we've already overrun, I would have to call this session to a close and I'd like to thank Dr. S. P. Chan uh, for this very enlightening talk about diabetes. And if you have any questions, you can uh, direct it to Subang Jaya Medical Center or to Dr. Chan. She will love to answer it. Thank you again and thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Aspi. Thank you, Jaya. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. S.P. Chan. I'm a consultant endocrinologist. Let me take you through a few basic facts on diabetes, followed by some very exciting advances in how I manage people with diabetes. First, how do you know that you have diabetes? It is blood sugar that is elevated when your glucose is higher than 7 millimoles when you are fasting, higher than 11 millimoles after eating. That means you have diabetes. How common is diabetes? Our recent government survey done in 2019 found that 18% of adult Malaysians have diabetes. So we have a big burden and many people don't know they have diabetes. What else do we know about diabetes? We know that diabetes doesn't come alone. It comes with other problems, medical problems that increase the risk of having heart disease and other complications. Our cardiologists have done a registry and they found that in fact, one in two people admitted for heart attacks in our hospitals have diabetes and diabetes contributes to heart attacks. So what should you do if you have diabetes? It's not all bad news. Now there's a revolutionary new system is continuous glucose monitoring ability. This is a new technology that has changed the lives of people with diabetes. What they do is to put something behind their arm, a glucose sensor, and that sensor stays on the arm for two weeks. And over that entire two weeks, the person can use a reader and it will tell you the glucose level without having to prick your finger. I would like anybody who has diabetes, this is a take-home message. Know your A, B, C. A means A1C. Glucose level average over the last three months. Your A1C should be less than 7%. B is blood pressure. Know your blood pressure less than 140, less than 90. What about C? That stands for cholesterol. Know your LDL cholesterol. If you have very high risk, sudah kena heart attack, you want to have your LDL as low as possible, less than 1.4. If you have medium risk, only got diabetes, nothing else, then you can allow your LDL to be less than 2.6. For those of you who have diabetes, remember, you need to know your A, B, C.